Yo, Elliot, I want to influence my father. My dad is a good man. He fed me well, dressed me, taught me certain lessons, but there's insecurity in him that stems from his traumas. He's not a spiritual guy or religious, so there's a lot that he doesn't know about how to manage the emotions and stress. Instead, he acts tyrannical at times. And the other end of that is he's a calm guy with some self-esteem problems. So he does that, that uh, coward tyrant thing that we've spoken a lot about here. Most Robert Moore says, if you scratch, scratch a coward, a tyrant comes out, right? And so that's, a, that's, a, that's an archetype. That's a pattern. He also says, I don't know what he would do if he took my suggestion seriously, because in the past, he's been unknowing about certain boundaries when learning ways of being, so he just gives up on it. This is one of the emotional traits of my dad. The question is, should I even try to intervene? Here's my, he's my dad and I respect that boundary. I still look up to my father and respect him, even when he's being tyrannical. Sometimes it feels weird giving suggestions to my father about important things. He's an open-minded man, just low to medium morale and has some cowardly traits. So I don't know where I'm going to go with this, but I have to say that I'm listening to a conference given by Father Chad Ripperger right now. It was the 2002 uh, uh, Spiritual Warfare Conference, and you could, eat, you could buy it online. If you guys are interested, I can share the, the, the link with you. Um, and in it, he talks about authority structures. Because in, in spiritual warfare, authority structure is everything. He says that demons are like, uh, or are like uh, lawyers from hell. <laughs> they know the divine law very well. Most of us don't know the divine law. That's why we can very easily be influenced by demons. He says they know the divine law and they never step outside of it because everything that they do is ordered. This is so fascinating, right? He's, he's a uh, angelic. He studies spirits. He's an exorcist. So he knows, he deals with demons on a daily basis. It's crazy hearing his stories. He talks so frank about demons. Oh, yeah, one day I was talking to this demon. <laughs> I'm like, wow. But, but through his studies and experiences, this guy is wild. He uh, asserts that demons have a spirit, have a, an authority structure. And so, for example, the, there's an authority structure in the home where a husband can pray in order to uh, deliver his wife from demonic oppression. But a wife can't do the same because there's an authority structure. The wife can pray to Jesus to help her husband, but she can't deliver. She can't uh, speak to the demon to come out of her husband the same way a husband can. And a husband can speak deliverance into his children's lives in a different way. So the husband is the top of the authority structure in the home, right? And then he has authorities too, like a priest, a bishop, pope, you know, Christ himself. But that authority structure needs to be honored always. He also goes on to say he gave a really good, uh, he's telling a story about a lady, a woman, who her father was on his deathbed. He was dying, but he was demonically afflicted, almost like your dad. I'm not saying your dad's issues are demonic, but I'm going to come to a full point here. Uh, she was like, yeah, my father is, uh, he, he's been suffering. He's been struggling for a long time, but he refuses to see a priest. She wanted him to go see a priest so that he could be absolved of his sins and, and maybe even have an exorcism, right? And so she went to Father Ripperger. And Ripperger asserts that because of the sixth commandment, I believe it's the sixth commandment, because of the sixth commandment, it is her duty to honor her father. And so although she can't, she doesn't have the authority to exercise or to deliver him from the demonic oppression, but she can pray for his deliverance uh, such that God will intervene, right? Let God intervene. Pray to God for him to intervene on behalf of the child for the parent, right? So there's sort of a, there's sort of a back door, right? You can't, you don't have the authority over the demon that 
God has given authority over to, to inflict that person. God gives certain demons the authority to afflict somebody. Demons can't afflict you unless you open the door and God says, go. God gives his permission. Why, you might say? Well, because for many of us, we don't come to virtue until we fight with our vices. And so a lot of times there's demonic affl affliction God uh, uh, allows to happen to us. He gives that demon authority. He says, yes, okay, fine. Go screw with him. And if you, you know this is true if you, believe in the, if you believe the Bible, because he did that with Job. I don't know if you remember the story in Job. It's the Old Testament. But Job was cool. Job had a great life. He was a righteous man, it says. But the devil came to God and said, hey, I bet I can throw off your dude over there. And God's like, nah, Job, Job's a man. You ain't going to mess with Job. And so the de demon says, let me try. This is all in the Bible. And God says, okay, go ahead. So the demon goes and afflicts Job, screws him up, screws up his whole life. Job stays, Job stays faithful. And so in that story, you see that God allows this to happen to some people because it's essentially for a number of things, but for most of us, it's for our own good, right? I wouldn't have reverted to the faith. I wouldn't have come home to the Lord right? My name means the Lord is my God. And I forgot that the Lord was my God. Had I not been afflicted, I know I was afflicted. I wasn't possessed, right? There's like deep, severe demonic possession, but I was being afflicted. I know because I look at my life and how it started going spiraling downhill. And I could, I could pretty much point to the sins that I was committing that opened the door for God to say, okay, go mess with Elliot because he needs to come home. And if he doesn't, well, then you know, so be it. Well, I'm happy I came home. With your father, this affliction is for his good, and it's only happening because God has allowed it. But out of your piety and respect and honor for your father and for Christ in your father, it is your duty to pray for him. I know I'm not giving you a practical answer like you might want to hear, but I don't want us to allow this to fly under the radar. I know I've allowed this to fly under the radar. Uh, the, just listening to this conference has reminded me that I need to pray for my children more. He says, as a father, you should be praying to praying for uh, the demons to stay away for your children all the time. There was a time when I was doing it a lot because I was one of my children was struggling. And as soon as my child started like, oh, I'm like, okay, I got my life in order. Cause that's the first thing. Your prayers are essentially ineffectual if you're living in a state of grace. So for whoever you're praying for, if you're living in a, if you're, I'm sorry, living in a state of sin, if you're living in a state of sin, your prayers are less effective than if you get righteous, you get right, right? You, you have your sins absolved and you stay in a state of grace. Your sins, I mean, your, your prayers are like on steroids when you're living in a state of grace. That's why it's important for us, even as children towards our parents, stay in a state of grace and then pray for your parents. Stay. I had to get into a state of grace in order to pray for my children, right? And so that gives me more motivation to stay in a state of grace because I have authority over my children. And as a father, you have full authority to cast the demons out, call them away. Um, over your children, right, because of that authority structure. So um, once again, just coming full circle, I think prayer is a very powerful weapon. I know it's a very, very powerful weapon. There's no question about it. We are swimming in and impressed upon by the, the, the divine realm, right? Heaven is not up, up and away somewhere. It impinges upon us constantly. We are surrounded by warring angels, warring angels. Why warring angels? Because we're in a battle and there are demons that want to derail you. They want to destroy you. And it sounds like your father is, is struggling in that way. I would continue to give him information. You're doing a good job. Continue to give him information. If he listens, that's great, right? But if he has, if he proves to have poor self-control, it could be that he's having demonic flare-up, right? And you said he has past traumas. 
it's such a great conference. I'm really just pulling a lot of what I'm talking about from this conference I'm listening to. Um, traumas are a door. Traumas are a door for demonic influence, right? If you have a trauma, it can change your mind, right? A trauma changes the 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 way the synapses in the brain go off, right? You repatterns your brain, right? You have a trauma, like say, for example, you get bit by a dog. Well, then like that leads to a rewiring of your brain. So now that every time you see a dog, you freak out, right? And that freak out can allow a demon to have a grip on you. Oh, fear. And demons love when you're afraid. Oh, there's a fear here. And that could become ever present, right? Any that person can now live with a fear because of one thing that happened. So I'll say this, that if there are traumas there, there, there may be demonic oppression. And as an exorcist, he was saying this, he says that of the 1000, he says, for every 1000 people that come to me that think they need an exorcism, three of them actually need an exorcism. Most of them just need to clean up their lives, get into a state of grace. And it's always helpful when others are praying for them, right? If your dad, if you can help your dad clean up his act, right? Meaning like if you see there are various sins in his life and you can show him how that's sinful and, you know, your name is Serrano, last name Serrano. So maybe, I don't know if you're Italian or, um, or Spanish or Mexican or something like that, but maybe you're Catholic. Well, then you have the authority structure at your hands. You have the sacraments available to you. If you're, even if your father's not a practicing Catholic, you can convince him. It might be a good idea, dad, just to go and repent, repent for your sins, go to uh, the, the, receive the sacrament of reconciliation, do some penance, and absolve yourself of those sins, have the priest absolve you of those sins, work to sin no more, because that's usually what the priest says afterwards. He says, oh, go and sin no more, right? After you are absolved, he says, okay, good, go and sin no more. And so if your father, if you can convince him to do that, to, to, to wash himself clean of sin and to stay in a state of grace, that's a, that's a big step in the right direction for having him. Now, what happens when we're in a state of grace now, now, in a way, we take away the authority that a demon has over us. When we're in a state of grace, we're basically saying to the, we're, we're saying that, no, I'm under the authority of Christ. I'm not under the authority of this demon. And you assert that by going to confession and remaining in a state of grace. That demon can't bother you anymore. He'll try, he'll whisper, he'll tempt you, but he's no longer, he no longer has that authority over you. And you have to keep that up. This is another one of those things that where Protestants and Catholics disagree. Protestants think you get you get baptized once, and now that you're free, and that's it. You're going to heaven, right? A, a kid at my event this weekend, he I was explaining to him, you know, he was he was trying to understand some Catholic theology, and I explained to him, he tried to say to say to me that he's a saint. I'm like, uh, okay, good for you. I don't know how you managed to be a saint. I know I'm a sinner. Right? Even as a practice in Catholic, I, I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. Venial sins in my thoughts and in my feelings, and, and, and I've committed mortal sins. Of course, I have the sacraments to, to deal with it. Um, but I seek the authority structure because they have 2,000 years of tradition and wisdom, right? Exorcists have been around for a long time, and they pass this wisdom on. This is demonic... Uh, uh, college spiritual warfare college right they go to so anyway um have your you convince you know if you speak to your father and your state you're in a state of grace convince him that it'd be a good idea to get into a state of grace and then he's got to continue to work on it and the way he'll work on it is with the information that you provide him and by praying right pray pray you pray for your father have your father pray and now you have the assistance of the mighty warring angels. Imagine you have an entire celestial army, right? This is why I keep an icon of St. Michael the Archangel. He is the, he's the general of the, of, the, of the heavenly army, right? They even said like, uh, there were, I can't remember in the Bible, you know, I'm not a Bible scholar. Um, but they're a host, they're a host of heavenly armies that are willing to come to your aid. 
And each one of us also has a guardian angel. We believe in so many things that are not helpful to us that are not even true. And we have a hard time, I guess, because our culture doesn't promote it. Culture d denigrates it. But you have spiritual warriors at your beck and call waiting to help you. And so you may, be, you may even, Father Ripperger was talking about the guardian angel of a family. And when a man, when a man and a woman uh, get married and they receive the sacrament of matrimony, they're assigned an angel, a guardian angel over their family. And you can pray to that angel, right? Your family has a guardian, if your parents were sacramentally married, um, there's a guardian angel over your family. I'll leave you with this last piece. And again, this is all coming straight from Father Ripperger. <laughs> um, he says, this is such a, it is in the fourth video. I see somebody probably put a link there. It's in the fourth video where he talks about authority structures. He says, if in your family, and of course you're the child, he's the father. So I, I think it works this way, but it might, you know, it might not. But I'm going to say it anyway, because I think it's very powerful. He says that if you pray to the sorrowful heart of Mary, let me show you something. This is a, this is a painting of the seven sorrows of Mary. Mm -hmm. Mary takes on all of the sorrows of Christ's life, beginning with uh, when Simeon, when she brings him to the, to the temple, Simeon tells him, tells her that, He's going to pierce your heart. But then all the way through his passion, right? She was there when he was on the cross. She was there when he was being whipped, scourged. She was there when the crown of thorns were placed on his head. She was there when he was in the garden of Gethsemane, right? Not that she was there, but she, she felt the burden of the sins that he was taking on in his life. She lost Jesus for three days. She's got, these are all the sorrows of Mary, and when we pray to the to Our Lady of Sorrows, he calls it. Mm -hmm. When we pray to Our Lady of Sorrows for clarity, for clarity on the sins that are afflicting our family, she will show you. You can pray to Mary, right? Everybody can, right? All Catholics do. Protestants, for some reason, they they don't they, they don't, right? Uh, but you can right? If you believe that she's the mother of God and you believe in the intercession, intercessory prayers, you believe in communion with the saints and you're not, a, you're not a Christian if you don't believe in the Apostles' Creed because it was a statement of faith given by the early, earliest Christians, right? From, I think from the second century. Um, in, in the Apostles' Creed, it says, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. I believe in the communion of saints. If you believe in the communion, if, you, if, you're, a, if you're a Christian and you believe in the Apostles' Creed, you believe in the communion of saints. You can commune with St. Mary. You can ask her for intercession. Just like you ask your friend for an intercession, right? People will often say, hey, buddy, pray for me, right? Well, you can also ask the mother of God to pray for you. And you can pray to her, as particularly Our Lady of Sorrows, you can pray to Our Lady of Sorrows to reveal to you the sins that are afflicting your family, right? Again, I, I haven't done this. <laughs> I'm just relating to you what I've heard Father Ripperger, who is like the quintessential exorcist and, uh, and spiritual warfare expert of our day. There's no question about it. The guy's a genius. So these are all things that you could do that can help your father. And, uh, and I would encourage you to do so, dude. Hope that helps. Done. Yo, it's your bro, Elliot. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, you ought to know that it was a clip from one of my most recent King Transformation classes with my students, where among other things, we get together about four or five hours a week and we speak on things as it relates to becoming kings in our lives and fitness, business, and with women. That sounds like you and you want to join a like-minded group of men who are growing stronger every day in every way in this degenerate age, then it's real simple. Just follow me on Instagram and then DM me the word King, K-I-N-G, and then me and my team will get back to the details to see if you qualify. I really hope to see you at the next meeting. Done.